Good morning to you all and welcome back to the Mason, Hayes and Curran education team's webinar series. And I start this morning by introducing uh, my colleagues on this morning's webinar, uh, my partner Liam Reardon and my colleagues Catherine Kelly and David Ruddy, all of whom hopefully will be familiar to you from uh, previous contacts. Just a word of uh, housekeeping, we have disabled the Q&A uh, function because of the numbers on this morning's webinar. But what we have done is, in, in substitution, is, is, is we have received a very large number of queries from a lot of you, and thank you very much for those. And we've collated those, and we will be posing those queries, or many of them, um, and hopefully giving you uh, decent answers to them as we go through the various issues. A big thank you to uh, uh, NAPD for their assistance, particularly with queries and collating queries, uh, to, to make sure that we have a, a sharp pencil in relation to uh, what we're, we're talking about today. Now, since we last delivered webinars some, some time earlier in the summer, you know, the world and the world of schools has changed in very many ways. Uh, but one of the advantages is that we now have uh, you know, detailed circulars, guidance from various different parties for schools, department, public health, HSA. Having said that, I can really imagine that many of you feel somewhat overwhelmed by all of the uh, guidance coming at you and, and the requirement to take steps to reopen your schools. Um, but we on the education team have been really struck in recent weeks by the extraordinary amount of work that many of you have done, all of you have done, and, and we really feel confident that this will stand to each of your schools in the weeks, uh, days and weeks ahead. The title that we've chosen for today's webinar is Limiting Your School's Exposure to Liability as You Prepare to Reopen. And we've deliberately used the word limiting, not eliminating. Um, and, and, you know, that's in the context of, um, you know, a very strong decision from government towards the reopening of schools, not just government, but I would argue, you know, the entire Irish people are, be, are behind you in this. There will be risks. What we're going to try to do this morning is to identify some, not all of those risks, and look at some of the measures that you can take to, to, to limit those risks and limit your liability. But it is important to remember in this whole situation that this is not a game of perfect. Schools and principals can only do their best. Our hope and our aim with today's webinar and more generally is to try to assist you in making sure that your best is, is sufficient. Now we have a fairly broad range, broad canvas of topics today. Unashamedly, we will be repeating some things we've said on previous webinars. But the advantage now is that we can deliver our advice and our support in the context of guidance uh, from the Department and Public Health. Um, by way of just reference to a roadmap, there's publication 16 major ones we've, we've, we've We've identified circulars, induction programs, information notes, all coming at you. And we've described these as live documents because the number of them have changed recently and the number of them will change in the days and weeks ahead. So there were major updates, for example, on the 19th of August to some of the guidance. So, you know, you've got to keep, try to keep up to date on, look, keep on the various changes that are going to take place. A word about the COVID response plan, something that you will be more than familiar with. Um, these are six areas that we're going to try to focus on on, on this morning um, and uh, pose and answer hopefully questions on each of these areas. And just finally, uh, don't allow your school to score a known goal. There are four uh, plans or statements that your school is expected to have adopted uh, and ratified. And there should be a note in your Board of Management minutes recording this uh, adoption or ratification. 
if you haven't done so already, it's never too late, better late than never, go and cause, call an urgent board meeting and just record the adoption ratification of these statements. David. Thank you, Ian, and good morning to all our participants. Um, I have a number of questions that I, I'm going to put you, uh, to you, Ian. And the first one is following last week's announcement in relation to restrictions, i.e. acceptable numbers for both indoor and outdoor uh, gatherings, can these apply in any way to a school setting? And we know that these uh, measures have convulsed our, our body politic. I really think this question centres around maybe staff meetings in particular. What's your advice to schools? Yeah, David, that's a, that's a kind of a tough topic. Um, because in engagements with principals in, in even within the last number of days, we all are aware of the real wish to, for principals to, to meet with their staff and for the staff to meet together. Um, many teachers are really, have been really looking forward to getting back to, to school. The problem is that, you know, a large staff meeting um, all together in a secondary school is arguably not in compliance with government guidance. Um, and we're familiar with, you know, um, uh, advice from, from some of the management bodies that really um, staff meetings should be um, held um, remotely. Um, I say this with a, with, a, with a really heavy heart, David, um, you know, because it's not kind of advice that we like giving, particularly for the reasons I mentioned. Um, you know, some principals have been talking about a really good idea of doing a walkthrough of their um, COVID response plan on the ground with the staff. Um, again, with a heavy heart, we feel that this perhaps will need to be done in smaller numbers, um, not with the whole staff together. Uh, which will involve repeat walkthroughs, if you like. But look, that's that's the advice that we feel we got to give, uh, you know, reluctantly. So a conservative approach in relation to staff meetings. Second question here, a uh, really interesting one is: Should we continue to allow students off campus at lunchtime? So a lot of post-primary schools do. Yeah, our, our our position really on that is that lunchtime is part of the school day. And I know that many schools would allow uh, the older students in particular to go down to town if they have parental consent. Uh, I, you've used the word conservative, David. You know, our position is that this is undoubtedly increasing risk. We know that students like going down to town and maybe meeting up with students from another joining school and that kind of thing. Um, but really, can this be justified um, in this kind of COVID world in which we live. And our, our view is cons conservative approach, really that needs to be maybe temporarily suspended. Okay, um, another question here is, is the school obliged to supply face coverings to students? So I, I, as you can imagine, students will arrive sometimes accidentally or unintentionally without these, these coverings. But, so what's the duty of schools there? Yeah, well, look, David, um, I think we've all rocked up to our local shop about to go in recently to do a bit of shopping and suddenly looked in our pocket and found we don't have our face masks. So human nature, people will forget face masks. Um, our position is that the primary obligation is not on schools to provide either staff or students with face masks, okay? Um, um, that it, this is a government requirement. It's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a school-based requirement um, from the from a start. But it is an, it is mandatory for that schools would implement government policy. Um, but on a practical level, to deal with, you know, either a staff member or a student who has forgotten his or her mask, you know, we would recommend that. Uh, the principal might, for example, have a supply of face masks um, in, in the office that could be supplied to deal with the, the, the forgetful person. But just to answer your question, we don't feel that this is primarily 
uh, a school obligation to provide everybody with masks, PPE. Oh, okay, and just one final question, uh, and this is, uh, what is our legal position if a student refuses to self-isolate for 14 days after travel to a non green list country? So they arrive on the doorstep and we know or have information that they have been in a non green list country. What yeah, well, that, that perhaps is going to happen. I would be surprised if it doesn't. You know, there's a, there's a department FAQ document that many of the principals will be familiar with. And there's a particular section on travel abroad. And it says that it is a requirement for anybody who travels back to Ireland from a non green list country to restrict their movements. It defines what strict restricting movements uh, is, you know, stay indoors, avoiding contact, social situations, and certainly avoiding school situations. It states expressly staff, parents, students are included within this. Um, and it says if a school has reasonable grounds for believing that a staff member or a pupil has not observed the tra uh, travel abroad uh, requirement, which is described as mandatory, it is reasonable for a school to refuse access to that staff uh, member or that or that pupil. It does clarify that, you know, um, a pupil, for example, living with somebody who has a family member who has returned from a, from a non green list country, that student is not required to restrict their movements. It's only if the student himself or herself or indeed a staff member has been abroad that the, that the requirements kick in. Okay, thanks for that clarification, and I'll be back to you in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to move on to Liam. Good morning, Liam. Uh, and Good morning, David. Good morning, everyone. The first question uh, for you this morning is, um, it, it states, a staff member has said that if the response plan is not up to scratch, the board of management can be reported, reported being in brackets. Uh, is that true? And if so, to whom? What's your take on that, Liam? Dave, um, yes, uh, um, um, you can be, uh, 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 um, schools are workplaces. And so uh, as, as with all workplaces, uh, they, uh, they come under the auspices of the Health and Safety Authority. So uh, in theory, uh, a school could be reported to the Health and Safety Authority or for whatever reason, the Health and Safety Authority may decide to carry out an inspection uh, itself of school premises. Um, I don't want to over, over, uh, over egg this, if you like. Um, um, if you are, um, if somebody, be it a parent, member of staff, or, or whatever, makes a complaint about uh, schools' compliance or whatever with um, COVID requirements, for example, and if that goes to the HSA, uh, there, there are two aspects to whatever investigation the HSA will carry out. Uh, the first is procedural, the second is, is substantive. So in the first instance, the HSA will look at your compliance. Uh, as Ian was saying, you know, have, you, have, you, have you ratified your policies? Um, do you have a COVID-19 response plan? Uh, have the staff received induction training? And so on. So that's the first thing. So what we'd be saying is just you know, make sure you are compliant. Um, the HSA has its you know, hands full in the sense that um, just think back to the controversy over the inspection of the, the meat plants, so on, a few weeks ago. So they're covering the entire country. Um, I know from my own experience in dealing with a particular school where a, a parent who was fixated on health and safety made a complaint to the HSA several months ago. Um, the HSA acknowledged it and they've sat on it ever since, essentially. So um, um, it is possible that, there, that the HSA could become involved in your school. Um, um, uh, as I've said, they have a lot on their plate. That could change, for example, if there were to be a significant number of uh, outbreaks in schools uh, um, which, which require the involvement of the HSA or something. But that's, that's speculative. Um, I think the takeaway here is uh, procedural compliance. Make sure you have your, your ducks lined up and your boxes checked. Thanks for that clarification, uh, Liam. I'm now going to uh, move over to Catherine, Catherine Kelly. Uh, good morning, Catherine. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Just a uh, question in relation to a novel appointment of the lead worker representative. And the question here flows from um, 
How significant is the role of the lead worker in comparison to the health and safety representatives? So maybe this questioner is a bit, um, feels there's a muddiness uh, in delineation of responsibilities. Any comment on that? Well, the first thing I'll say is that it's two very distinct roles. Um, and it's important to remember that there is really, really good guidance on gov.ie in relation to the lead worker and appointing one. Um, what I will say is that um, the lead worker only deals with COVID-19 issues. Um, so the lead worker will be going to the principal um, and then to the board of management. And if they don't feel that it has been resolved at that stage, then they need to go to the health and safety representative in the school. But they're two very different roles. And what you're saying is there's a process there. Um, yes, under the guidance, there is a must, process. You must follow. Yeah, and there will be induction training available from the department in relation to what is required of a uh, worker in schools. Okay, thanks for that. And I'll be back to you in a few moments. Uh, back again to Liam in relation to the whole question of uh, cleaning and hygiene. And as we know, that's going to be critical uh, to the continued uh, safe uh, reopening uh, of schools. And Liam, the, the, the question here is, uh, can I use daily checklists to ensure that the cleaning is satisfactorily completed? And the backdrop here, I suppose, is a comparison with hotels, coffee shops, and probably in, in the past, schools were quite casual about the cleaning. Mm. There, it wasn't checklist. So is it fair now to come in and demand that the cleaners um, adhere to checklists and are accountable in that way? Uh, um, yes, I, do. I, I don't see why not, David. Um, and there's a reason why the hospitality sector um, has, uh, has, has that practice. And uh, I, th I, 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 I think it's a good practice and one uh, that schools might consider. Um, as, as a school, you're, you're going to have your cleaning plan uh, uh, worked out. So um, uh, cleaning and hygiene has mo moved up the priority list, if you like. Um, uh, the overwhelming requirement is that your school is, is, is kept, is cleaned appropriately and that hygiene standards are, uh, uh, are maintained. So you need to look at your cleaning function. You need to look at the... the the, the, uh, the cleaners you have, whether you employ cleaners directly or whether you engage contract cleaners. And uh, are they, um, do you have the resources necessary to implement your cleaning plan? Um, if you do, that's wonderful. Um, if, you, if you don't, you're going to need to look at, do you need to get your existing cleaners to uh, increase their hours of work, for example, uh, or do you need to take on additional cleaners? Uh, do you need to take on, um, to increase the level of um, you know, contract cleaners that you engage. Uh, now, obviously, you'll be talking to your own cleaners uh, and uh, um, they have to be uh, inducted back into the school just as everybody else has to be. Uh, what, the, what I would like principals to bear in mind is that the overriding priority is that the school be cleaned and be cleaned appropriately. So if, for example, you have a situation where your existing cleaners are saying that they're not prepared to increase their hours of work, for example, well, then you need to engage additional cleaning support staff, either directly or by way of contract cleaners. Um, obviously, um, if, you're, if you're changing the terms and conditions of work of your existing employees, you need to look at changing their contracts or amending them appropriately or talking to them about that. Um, as with everything in this space, the key thing is communication, talking to the, to the people who are currently cleaning your school, looking at what you need to do to enhance that provision and t taking the necessary steps to do that. Okay, thanks for that, Liam. And I'll, I'll come back to you in a couple of moments. Um, Catherine, I want to move back to you uh, with a question here. And it is, um, it is inevitable that our school will have to deal with a suspected case of COVID-19. Uh, what are the legal considerations? Well, it is inevitable um, that there will be suspected cases with all of the children coming back and especially coming into flu season now. So um, there are 
detailed guidance. Uh, there is detailed guidance again in relation to it. Um, you need to isolate that child as much as you can. If you have an isolation area in the school, that's great. If not, you will need to um, place that child um, socially distanced away from other staff, from staff and other children. Um, in relation to a student, you need to try and get in contact with the parent, legal guardian, so that they can be collected straight away. Um, and it's very important that they follow up in relation to their return to the school. Um, there may be issues in relation to trying to get some kind of certification to say that they're okay. Um, maybe a call with the GP uh, to make sure that everything is okay would be sufficient um, in order to get them back into the school after that. And uh, another question there is if a, a case, uh, a suspected uh, case returns to school not having given you these reassurances, would you let them back into your school? Well, I, I think principals need to be very forthright with pa parents in relation to this. I mean, it, it, it is a public health issue and it is trying to make sure that everyone in the school environment is safe. So I don't think that I would be happy allowing them back into the school until I have those reassurances. And Catherine, another issue that's um, coming into the office uh, in relation to queries to the education team is the whole question of data protection. and. Um, in relation to suspected cases. Uh, what would you say in relation to that? Well, we have to be really careful here is what I would say. I mean, it is inevitable that people will know uh, who is involved because of a small school community. But what I would say is that that information, the name of that person or that student cannot come from school management. And we need to be very careful about that, about breaching GDPR. So and, and David, just, yes, just, yes. To, just to say, to say uh, the principal on to me yesterday uh, around this whole area, and he just mentioned, he said two, two, two things, just as, 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 as Catherine had mentioned, communication, but also rehearsal was a big thing in terms of dealing with the kind of suspected cases. It was just a, a little nugget of information that a principal said to me yesterday. You know? Because it is inevitable, there will be a suspected case. So we are see uh, Thanks for that, uh, Catherine and Ian. As I have you here now, um, I have a question here. Questions in relation to indemnity. Now, as you know, and, and the rest of the team, uh, lots of questions coming in about this uh, into 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 the office. Am I indemnified if a pupil uh, or a member of staff contract COVID nineteen? Well, well, the first thing to say, uh, without stating the blind, the obvious, David, is that if somebody contracts COVID-19 in the school, it doesn't necessarily imply that the school has done anything wrong. Um, uh, and then, therefore, it doesn't necessarily kind of um, impose some sort of a liability on the school. But we know that, notwithstanding what I've just said, somebody could could bring a claim um, so we have liaised with the the main insurers for schools um, and indeed we've spoken with the, with, the, with the main brokers as well and our very clear understanding is that the indemnity that schools enjoy under their insurance policies will continue um, to apply to um, a situation like you've outlined, uh, provided the school has adopted and, and is using its best endeavours to comply with DES and public health guidance. That's, 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 that's the base, that's the fundamental requirement. So, you know, um, the answer to your question is yes, with that proviso. Right, well, that, that would be very reassuring to people. Uh, the second question is in relation to school transport, and this is continually uh, evolving. Only yesterday, um, uh, Bus Aaron came out and said that they couldn't um, guarantee a 50% capacity maximum, and that until such time as they get additional buses, uh, th there will be more than 50% uh, on the buses. But the question here, Ian, is I'm extremely worried about school transport as we have no control over it. Uh, what can we do to ensure that pupils and buses do not jeopardize all the good work we have done? Fair question. 
Fair question, uh, uh, David, and, and a question that a lot of people are asking. Um, but, I mean, it, it needs to be said, and I know your principals will understand this, that the school uh, does not either have responsibility for or authority over the school transport system and the school bus. The only real involvement of a school in relation to the transport system is where um, there is a bus escort on the bus. Um, and as your schools will know, the school is the um, employer of the bus escort. Um, but other than through liaising as regards the conditions on a school bus through the bus escort, it, it's school employee, that's really the extent of the school's entitlements in relation to the school bus. That's, that's really the situation. So we're, we're stuck with that. Um, and final question uh, is in relation to uh, premises. Um, I have to hire an adjacent community centre to house classes to facilitate social distancing. What advice are you giving schools? And again, uh, a lot of work, you do a lot of work in this particular area. So um, what is your experience? Yeah. Well, well uh, David, the, the situation is that many schools will be familiar with advice they have received uh, from us that if they have, if they're, if they're licensing out for, um, school space that they're not using or not using after school hours, for example, they should incorporate that uh, arrangement in a license agreement. Um, now, this is a situation where on a temporary basis to deal with the COVID situation, a school is licensing in additional space. But likewise, the, that arrangement should be covered by a license agreement. Um, we would always recommend that. Also, we would also recommend that you, if you are if you're licensing in additional space, for example, a community hall or a parish hall or whatever it is, adjacent, adjoining, adjoining the school, this should be notified to your school insurer because you are, in effect, increasing the, the, the size of, like, of the school property. And that's a relevance. And your school insurance should be extended to that uh, additional property. And also, just looking at the final bullet point there, your, your, your cleaning protocols. I mean, obviously, this is a temporary increase in the school premises. And your obligations as regards that this additional space and keeping it clean and keeping it safe for everybody should be extended to the additional space. I mean, that goes without saying. So there's a checklist there and it, it, it must be dealt with. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, the next piece is in relation to physical distancing. And I would say masks in particular. And I'll invite the team to come in if they see fit uh, in, in relation to this. Uh, and the question is, um, I think our, um, our school is well prepared, but I'm afraid our activist heal is social distancing. How will I deal with requests uh, from pupils not to wear face coverings? And as we know, the department have given guide guidance and they have said that um, all post-primary students should, in fact, wear a mask with certain um, exemptions. And these exemptions also have been listed. I won't go through them, but difficulty reading, uh, particular children with special education needs, um, intellectual disability, etc. So the guidance is there, but I think this question really hovers over a situation where somebody, uh, schools will have the medical information about a lot of uh, students who may be exempted, but what about those that they don't have medical information about? Um, uh, how tough should schools be there? Is it fair to ask for a letter from the GP uh, as to why face coverings cannot be worn? Uh, my view it is a, a reasonable request. And I know that the office have had, um, Catherine, um, I, I know you shared a, a story with me this morning in relation to that. Um, well, it's in relation to the under 13 issue um, that yes. um, they're asking if, uh, if they should have to wear masks if they're in post-primary post and they're under 13. And I am wearing many hats at the moment because my eldest daughter is about to start first year in secondary school and mm. she is 12 and they have been informed um, and she will be wearing a mask. It's compulsory for them to wear a mask, even though they're under the age of 13. 
Okay, so that, that says it all, as it were. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Liam? I think, I think, I, David, I think David, yeah. I, I think David it, it's worth saying, we were just chatting before this webinar, that within the last 48 hours, this has been one of the biggest issues coming in. Our mm -hmm. government had numerous schools on, on to us. Um, and, you know, um, we have every situation from um, parents who have a principled objection to wearing masks, you know, and, and, and complying with other measures, to other parents who are at the very anxious end of things. And this is really challenging for a lot of uh, principals um, because the, the, like the, 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 the boundaries are being pushed out as regards exemptions. We've had parents saying, you know, I'm not getting a letter from my doctor. I'm not incurring that cost. I'm just telling you that we've had parents claiming that this is discriminatory and unlawful. We have parents uh, alleging that there are fundamental constitutional rights that we're breaching. Um, and Liam has, has, has if you like, uh, been dealing with a couple of those particular uh, issues. I mean, maybe Liam, you might... That's true. Yeah, that's true, Ian. Um, on, on, only this morning, I, I was contacted by the principal of a secondary school who had a letter, uh, you know, a long two-pager, um, quite well put together, uh, dealing with everything from sort of um, um, anti-vaccination through hand sanitizing, face masks, um, making the point that the school was prohibited from even inquiring whether their child had a hidden disability as that was discriminatory in itself. So on the face of it, a relatively well put together letter, but if you look at it closely, it also, there were um, hints that it may very well be, um, you know, a cut and paste job that we may see, uh, um, I, I suspect that we're going to see uh, that we're going to get more queries from schools in relation to letters of this type. Um, um, I could be wrong, but it, it, um, it just had that look about it. So I think the issue of parents saying that they're not consenting to their child wearing the face mask, um, as you say, that's a hot topic. It's going to get hotter. And um, um, ultimately, um, as David said earlier, when we we're talking about this, the burden of proof is with the parents. If you say that your child um, comes within one of the exemptions or has a disability, the burden of proof is on you to show that. Now, in some cases, uh, the schools will know the family, they will know the child, they will have medical reports already, and it'll be, if you like, a straightforward bona fide case where a child has an obvious disability and obviously comes within an exempted category. But for parents who are just saying on the face of it that my child has a disability, for example, asthma, but I'm not going to the doctor. Well, I think, you know, that's their, that's their call, but they don't come you know, they don't come to school without a face mask, would be my... Be my could, I just, could I just add on that, that you would have to consider other parents as well, because yeah. there will be other children in that class, or other students in that class that may have underlying conditions and disabilities, and you're yeah. putting them at risk. And I'd much prefer to have to defend a claim stating that you had yeah. made everyone wear a face mask in those circumstances, if there yeah. was some kind of illness as a result of somebody not wearing a face mask. Yeah, I completely, yeah. completely agree. Yeah, yeah. You you okay. mentioned David. You mentioned David a few minutes ago. Conservative approach, and certainly as regards health and safety, wearing of masks, complying with requirements, unless they come strictly within the exemptions set out in government. And <clears throat> uh, our simple advice is: you follow the rules. And if that means that a child is not uh, permitted to come to the school, so, so be it, you know. Thanks, well, the message is very clear from all, all three of you. Thank you for that. Just briefly, in relation to the international experience, um, Denmark has been held up, and even last night uh, I, I, on some program, I heard it been mentioned again, they reopened early. Very positive experience, uh, the, the incidents, um, uh, of, of coronavirus actually went down nationally uh, parallel to the schools reopening. The pod system was seen to have been very effective. Uh, they were fortunate to have outside uh, outdoor classes, which of course uh, we certainly won't be able to rely on. Hand washing was there, but communication uh, and um, 
our team members have been alluding again and again to communication. Good communication was seen to be critical. It is important to point out that some other countries haven't been as success successful. Uh, take Israel, for example. Um, they were very casual about the reopening of schools. And they were very unfortunate uh, in relation to uh, one of the early weeks they, there was a heat wave and uh, windows which were open for ventilation were closed, air conditioning was turned on, and people were exempted from wearing masks, so we had a perfect storm. But I don't think you're going to have to worry about heat waves or indeed air conditioning or that, so hopefully we won't experience that. Uh, we're now going to move on to Circular 49 2020, and I have no doubt that that circular has been on your desk and you've been trying to make sense of it. Uh, and um, I have a question here uh, for Lean. Uh, it states, I feel circular 49 2020 challenging in view of the amount of queries I've had from my staff. Can you explain it in a nutshell? Tall order Lean, but... Thanks, David. Uh, <laughs> thanks, I'll do my best. Good luck. Um, <laughs> it's, a com it's a complicated circuit. Uh, it's, it's a complicated circular, uh, and there's a lot of information in it. And, um, and I've, I've gone back to it several times. And so what I, I would say to, 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 to principals is, you know, keep on going back to it. If you have a query in relation to some aspect of it, go back and have a look at it because there's too much in it to learn off pat. You know, you're just not gonna be able to do it. <clears throat> Essentially what it does is, it does a couple of things. It provides special leave with pay for teachers and SNAs with a diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, and it sets out what um, teachers and SNAs are required to do if they, if they, if, if they become symptomatic. Um, they have to arrange tests and so on. There is a special leave with uh, pay, which is separate to sick leave. It turns out that they test positive and so, so on. There is um, res restricted movement if, you're, if you've been uh, in contact with somebody who's tested positive. There's a whole load of practical things like that. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. If queries arise, go back to the circular and look at it. The, the, there is an obligation on employees to, um, to communicate um, the results of testing to principals. So what I would say to principals is don't be shy about maintaining, about staying in contact. You're entitled to information from people in relation to um, what's, what's, what's happening, if they, like whether they've, 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 they've tested positive or whatever. Um, uh, the, 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 the circular uh, sets up two categories of employee, uh, one which is deemed to be very high risk and one which is deemed to be high risk. These categories derive from HSE guidelines um, and uh, um, somebody who's defined as being at a very high risk is somebody who has a specified medical condition set out in the HSE uh, documentation. If you have one of these underlying conditions, uh, you are at very high risk. Um, also, if you're over 70 and so on, you come into a very high risk category. But uh, it's mainly in relation to people with specific medical conditions. And if you're deemed to, have to be in that category, you stay at home and you cocoon. You do not come into work. You do not go to school. Um, you can be available for work. And if possible, you can work remotely or uh, arrangements can be made within the wider public service or whatever. Um, the high risk category we think is going to be more problematic. And that is people who are deemed to be at, at high risk if they contract COVID-19, but not at very high risk. So if you're in the high risk category, you have to come to, to school. Um, already the, uh, the ASGI have signaled uh, their unhappiness with this distinction between very high risk and high risk. Uh, FORSA on behalf of SNAs have uh, come in uh, 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 as well expressing concern about, about SNAs with serious medical conditions being required to come to work. The starting point is, is that these are medical uh, issues and the OHS Medmark in other words uh, has a crucial role in all this because it's, it's, it's Medmark that will be making the call as to whether somebody is in uh, a very high risk or a high risk category. What's, what's foreseeable is that there will be 
uh, conflict of medical evidence between evidence provided by a teacher or an SNA who's claiming to be in one or other category and where that's being disputed by, the, by, the, um, by Medmark. Ultimately, that's a medical matter and there's going to have to be some sort of, uh, you know, a resolution of that uh, whereby there is some sort of um, decision taken in, in relation to the, to the teacher or the SNA's um, state of health. So um, I think where, where issues arise, uh, as, um, they're going to have to, be, have to be dealt with on a case by case basis because each set of facts is going to be um, particular to the individual involved. And so I'd say <clears throat> to schools, if you have a query in relation to somebody who is claiming to be in, in either a high risk or a very high risk uh, category, um, take some advice on that. Uh, I know I'm currently advising a school where <clears throat> the secretary claims that she is in, that she's been told by her doctor that she's in, in a very high risk category. Um, uh, on the face of it, it doesn't appear as if she, as if she is, but, um, but we're, we're, uh, she's been asked to, to complete uh, a form for Medmark and she'll be referred to Medmark with a copy of her, her doctor's report. So, so Medmark in the first instance will make the call on that. Um, I think they're the main issues that arise from the circular day, but there's a, I mean, we, we, could, we could talk all, all morning about the details, but they're the main bits, if you like. I, I think you've achieved the object of answering that literally in a nutshell. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Thank um, you. Uh, I, I'm moving on to uh, a, a question really that crystallizes uh, a lot of what's, uh, what Liam has said or uh, referenced uh, to, to Catherine. Uh, and this is, um, I, I have a teacher uh, who, who, who has a consultant stating that she is in the very high risk category. However, the OHS has, she is high risk. Teacher queried same, and she was told it was up to the school to accommodate her. Uh, is this teacher entitled to demand a special education needs post rather than teaching maths? Uh, she's time to be able to teach maths to examination classes uh, at this late stage. So I know, Catherine, you spend uh, a lot of your work in life down at the Workplace Relations Commission defending boards in relation to the whole question of reasonable accommodation. You know what reasonable accommodation is all about. Can you assist that, that principle? Well, as Liam said, it's up to Medmark to decide. They make the call in relation to it. I have recently advised a school in relation to this. Um, a teacher who said she, was, she is very high risk. Her consultant was backing that up, but the OHS weren't um, saying that. Uh, but in the end... It, it, you know, they liaised with each other and she has now been deemed to be very high risk. Um, but that's a medical issue and the school just needs to support her in that and it needs to be sorted out between the consultant and Medmark, the OHS. So in relation to the special ed post, um, there is an obligation to reasonably accommodate, but that is reasonable. You know, if there's somebody already in the post um, at this late stage, it may not be possible to give her that role. Um, and you wouldn't be expected to do that, but you would need to see if that's possible and to try and as, uh, as, as much as you can um, to accommodate her in relation to her disability. Otherwise, you may have a claim uh, that you have discriminated against her. So you need to be very careful in relation to it. But there is, there is no obligation to give her that role. Okay, so there's no obligation there, but uh, to be seen to, to, to try and accommodate. Uh, yes. The yeah. second issue is in relation to pupils. And of course, some pupils with underlying health conditions uh, may not return or may not have returned uh, th this, this week. Uh, but you'll have other students um, who won't return because their parents don't want them to return. So what's the statutory obligations that are there uh, and how should, should schools be tough on, on situations where uh, some parents are going a la carte, as it were? Um, well, I can understand the, the anxiety and the stress around this and, you know, children returning to school and parents maybe being stressed out about it. Um, 
I think the main thing to do is to consult with the parents and to try and maybe reassure them um, and to speak to them in relation to what the school is doing. Um, and in the majority of cases, that may allay their fears and the, the child can come back. Um, I know that certain schools are dealing with the stresses that students may be encountering through their SPHE program to try and help them in relation to that. So there are various things that the school can do. There is recent guidance from the department just yesterday in relation to primary schools and how to deal with uh, children who are, are, being, are absent. Um, and we're awaiting guidance in relation to secondary schools. So we'll have to wait and see, but the primary school, um, the primary schools are being told to mark them as in attendance if they are um, not attending, but they're remote work, remote learning. Uh, you need to be putting in place something like that for them if they're not going to be attending at school. Um, and you need to just consult with the parents and stay in close contact with the parents. Um, there is an obligation to notify TUSLA after 20 days, so always remember that um, you need to notify them in relation to that. And on that note, uh, gu guidance for post-primary schools is eminent, uh, yes. is what you're saying. Okay. And just finally, um, all the evidence we, we have from our contacts with school leaders is that staffs are really going over and above and beyond in relation to trying to facilitate the reopening. Uh, however, um, there are issues in relation to asking teachers and SNAs to come in early in the morning to facilitate staggered starting times. Um, so, uh, are principals justified in doing that? Can they do it? What's your advice to them? Well, I think most people are being reasonable in the current circumstances, and it's not as if they're being asked to come in very early. I mean, it seems to be you know, uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. So I think in the majority of cases, there'll be absolutely no issue in relation to that because it's just basically, we're trying to get um, children back into school and to keep everyone as safe as possible. So I don't think there'll be any issue. I mean, technically it's not, you know, what they have signed up in their terms and conditions of employment, but there should be some flexibility in relation to it. Okay, thanks for that, Catherine. Um, Ian, I'm going to call you in, in on a circular. Uh, Liam referred to uh, 49, 2020, but there are also parallel circulars. Would you like to just... Yeah, it? thanks, David. The main thing I want to just bring to principal's attention is that there is this other circular, the one that Liam dealt with with teachers and SNAs. This is in relation to basically ancillary staff bus escorts. And the same principles that Liam... Uh, outlined, applied to them as well. So the concepts of restricted movement, you know, high risk employees, very high risk employees apply. Uh, and just to repeat what Liam said, I mean, every time we get a query on a member of staff over the past week or two, um, we have to get out the circular. These circulars have been, uh, have been drawn up carefully but they do give the vast majority of answers to queries, you know. Um, so I would just encourage you to follow the circular and follow the advice that Liam outlined earlier about, you know, the use of OHS where, when, when it's a medical issue, because we're not, we're not, schools are not doctors, you know. So in a, a, a related question here, I have a cleaner in her mid seventies who actually has returned to work are we okay to allow her continue working? Yeah, um, and we've had one or two queries like that. And if you like, one one's heart can go out to a member of staff in certain circumstances who may be um, over 70, for example. And I've had a story in the last couple of days, you know, of such a person, you know, who this is their life, you know, they're living on their own, they love working in the school, um, and this is, you can well understand that they are really anxious to get back to work. I mean, our, our advice is that, you know, whereas the expect, standard expectation of somebody who is uh, in this category is that they will cocoon, um, but, there isn't any legal prohibition on somebody in their 70s coming back to work. Um, we would be saying, first of all, uh, you need to get OHS 
uh, advice and support as regards the person's return. That, that would be important. Um, secondly, even if they do return, there is an obligation and it's stated in the circulars on school management to prioritize workplace arrangements so that the person can work as far as possible in a safe environment. And without stating that, you know, old chestnut case by case basis, but it does apply in this particular situation. But just to emphasize, OHS would be very important as regards, um, you know, a, a person that, uh, of the kind you've outlined. Okay, thanks for that, Ian. Liam, uh, I'm back to you and I have a question here. Uh, what happens when pupils frequent, uh, flagrantly breach etiquette by deliberately coughing uh, and refuse to sanitize hands in schools? So, Thanks, there? David. Yeah, uh, um, as we said in our webinar earlier in the summer about codes of behavior, um, yeah, uh, schools need to update their code of behavior to make sure that it is fit for purpose in terms of dealing with uh, students who breach what you might call COVID-19, you know, best etiquette. Um, and if you haven't done that, it, it's something that you should consider doing. Um, the key thing here is, is communicating with your parents and with your students. Uh, but uh, certainly, if there is, to state the obvious, uh, where a student um, re refuses to wear a hand mask or, or you know, coughs deliberately or whatever, they're not just endangering themselves, they're endangering others. They become a sort of a health and safety risk, which is unacceptable. Um, and so you need to ensure that your code of behavior uh, is fit for purpose to deal with that. And so there needs to be something in it which uh, empowers you to treat that as misconduct and I think you should let your parents know that that's what you intend doing um, um, let the parents association know uh, um, uh, um, maybe consider including it in, in whatever notification you're sending to your parents um, same broad uh, uh, approach applies to to staff um, uh, uh, we don't anticipate that that there will be the same um, the same number of incidents with uh, staff as there have been with um, students. Although I know Catherine, Catherine was advising in relation to a school secretary. I think you were Catherine, who oh. was using to wear a mask. Yeah, perhaps you, um, you might on that just. Well, I'll be honest with you. The principal involved uh, has been driven demented with mm -hmm. the secretary, who's categorically refusing to wear a mask. And um, we, I just, you know, we, I advised it's, 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 it's not um, following a reasonable instruction from the principal, which is yeah. clearly a disciplinary issue and needs to be dealt with under the disciplinary procedures. So he has issued her with a verbal warning in relation yeah. to her complete refusal to wear a mask, even though she's been asked over and over again. And hopefully that will uh, sort it out and we won't have to go any further into it. Yeah, but if you do have to go further with it, we would say, well, go further with it, you know. Um, 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 follow the logic of your own, of, 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 your, of, of your actions and um, follow the procedures. Well, it is a disciplinary issue. Mm, it is, a, absolutely. It is a, it's a disciplinary issue because it poses, uh, it poses a threat to the health and safety of others, not just to the person who's refusing. So, so serious consequences can arise from failing to comply with that reasonable direction. And that becomes potentially serious misconduct. So um, don't, don't minimize the uh, importance of people complying with your uh, directions and with the school directions in relation to, 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 to what you might call COVID-19 etiquette. It's vitally important that they adhere to it. And, and so your code and your disciplinary procedures use them would be the, the main takeaway. Okay, um, thanks for that. And uh, just uh, a final slide here we're going to look at. And um, the, the, the question here, Ian, is should we incorporate our COVID-19 risk assessment into the school safety statement itself? Thanks, David. Well, very briefly, I mean, I, I'd have an open mind as to whether the COVID statement is incorporated in the health and safety statement or is appended to it or annexed to it or whatever. They're all part of the same 
issue of health and safety, duty of care, keeping staff and, and students safe. So they should be together in some way, but how they are put together or how they are associated, I'd, I'd, be open, I'd, be, I'd have an open mind on. Um, this is a mock-up that some of you have kind of seen previously um, uh, at a previous webinar, um, and, and you'll all be very familiar with the concepts and the columns there. I would say one thing that, you know, uh, really I found very, very encouraging. I had a principal on to me on Monday saying that, you know, the response from his um, post holders around the fourth column there, taking responsibility for you know, implementing some of the control measures was really positive. There was just huge buy-in and acceptance and, and enthusiasm for taking. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen in every single school, but it, it was something that just struck me as very encouraging, and I would, I would hope that it was, it, was, it was a common experience. Okay, Ian, thank you. On that positive note, uh, as we come to a conclusion, uh, we would advise you again um, to have a checklist and uh, we've referred to the, the key, your key policies, health and safety statement, code of behaviour, data protection policy, to revisit them if you haven't already done so. We'd also like to highlight that the, uh, your new admission policy kicks in. Um, uh, September is, is the first opportunity to publish it, and October when we start to take um, applications for admissions. Uh, and uh, I would also point out that there are many useful resources available to you uh, from the Department of, of Education and that. In relation to uh, our previous webinars, uh, I think we have five webinars in total. Ian will be emailing you with a link to this webinar and indeed uh, to all the, the previous ones. And uh, we have a number of easings there that you may uh, wish to have a look at also. Um, at this stage, I'd like to thank uh, both Catherine, Liam, and Dean for uh, their very uh, incisive answers to, to your questions. Apologies for not getting to them all. I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution of other team members, uh, Paul Rochford and Fiona Scheel. Uh, they uh, fronted uh, a presentation, a webinar yesterday. Uh, and above all, we would say, and again, Dean said uh, at the top of the webinar that uh, there's huge appreciation uh, for the work that you've been doing and indeed for the sacrifices that you've made uh, throughout your, uh, a lot of you haven't ha had an opportunity to take proper summer holidays. Um, the government and I would say the whole of, of the nation are behind you in this effort and we want to wish you well. Um, uh, and we would say that uh, we at Mason, Hayes and Kern are available uh, to help you uh, if and when you need advice. Uh, feel free to lift the phone or to email us. So on that note, we'd like to say thank you for participating, for sending you. your questions, and the best of luck uh, with this new momentous uh, academic year. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.